I'm uh, Mike Atala. I'm in computer science. I've been at Purdue since 1982, and uh, I have done work in uh, early on in algorithms, data structuring, and uh, computational geometry, and uh, security also, uh, more recently security. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Neville. I have a joint appointment between computer science and statistics. I've been here for 12 years. Is that what we're supposed to know? Is <laughs> how long we've been here? Uh, my research area is machine learning and data mining. I focus on modeling graphs and other kind of complex uh, network data sets. I'm Eva Tardosh. I'm at computer science at Cornell University, and I'm just visiting here. Uh, I have worked on uh, algorithms to start with in earlier in my career, more recently on games, and for both cases, networks is certainly a big team. Uh, I do co-teach or sometimes teach a course uh, at Cornell called Networks that's based on the book uh, Networks, uh, Kratz and Markets. Uh, and the particular aspect of that my work involved is both um, uh, networks and actually modeling the feedback, feedback effect. Uh, we all have each other, on each other through our influences, through our networks of connections, by both by just using game theory uh, and thinking about incentives and also thinking about learning and how things evolve as each participant is trying to learn uh, what might work well for them in a network context. Um, I'm Sing Yun Lee. I'm a, a, I'm in the School of Communication. I joined Purdue in 2008. Um, my key focus is on um, network analysis. I usually look into networks that relate to communication, um, information sharing, and social support. And uh, recently, I've mostly been um, looking into disaster context, so how these um, patterns of networks among people and in communities impact their uh, return decisions evacuation decisions and also their um, rebuilding and recovery um, processes. Um, I'm Andrew Lu uh, from the uh, School of Industrial Engineering. I joined Purdue um, in 2009 and I'm an uh, associate professor there. Um, my research in interests are in optimization theories and uh, algorithms. Um, and there's an uh, application in game theory, like computing mesh and data. Uh, and also with the uh, main focus of application areas in the power systems or in the uh, energy uh, sector uh, as a whole. And I've been working on the, uh, uh, before on the uh, long-term ca uh, capacity planning and environmental policy analysis, but recently I've been shifting my focus on smart grid and uh, basically how to manage the distributed resources and how to make the demand response work. Great. So I'm sure in this course there's going to be a lot of questions you may have. Um, on the desks you have a pen and paper, so by all means write those down, and in the end we'll have an opportunity to ask those. Um, but we'll start off just to kind of set things. Um, we'll have each of the panelists kind of very quickly go through and give a vision of one of their finding of particular applications for the networked world going into the future. So whoever wants to start is, is free. So pick your um, energy markets, for example, and energy grids. Um, Andrew mentioned that. Um, Social networks. So. Yeah. Okay. I guess I can start. Um, so, well, the uh, the energy market or, or power system uh, to be to, to be specific, it's definitely uh, uh, so connected by physical transmission lines and dis distribution lines. But now recently, there's a you know the uh, the talk of the Internet of Things, and in my view, like smart grid or power system is at the front of that um, discussion, and. I learned this term from some other people called grid of things. The idea is really basically anything um, like your smart um, dishwashers, smart washers and dryers, and not to mention electric, electric vehicles, they can all be plugged in and they can all be controlled by uh, whatever algorithms that are there and they can be um, collectively used as resources for either help save energy or to, um, um, to even for, for example, for electric vehicles, they can be used as a storage collectively um, from the grid perspective. So uh, in my view, the, the future power grid is such a connected network, both by physical connection, but also can be by um, the uh, cyber side connection um, and uh, basically devices talking to each other, for example. Um, consumers, they have 
smart with the second stack talking to each other. And so uh, collectively, they can make a lot of uh, benefits to the consumers as a whole, but also there are a lot of uh, management issues, like there are so distributed resources without central control, how the distributed resources can uh, behave in the way you want them to, and, um, and you know, how they can be um, you know, having, and to bring them actually the so-called promised benefits to the whole system, uh, that in my view, it's a, it's a great area that's still at its infant stage that most people in the academia and in industry, they're trying to figure out the solution. That's great. So you have an example, I'm sure from social systems, how do you see the social world uh, changing in the next, say, few years on the network? I think um, one, of the, um, one of the aspects that uh, being paid attention to is actually the social systems are not isolated from physical systems. Um, so I would represent a um, social science aspect, but there is more focus on now. So for example, in disaster situations, we would look into how people are connected to each other, they're tied to their um, communities, um, organizations, and um, before, most of the research would have looked into social um, social networks and social systems is an isolated field, and the physical networks and infrastructure systems is another field. And now there's more um, focus on how the different networks are interconnected uh, with each other. So we might call them networks of networks or systems of systems. So for example, we've been looking into how, um, um, so for example, this case of um, how people um, had to have good um, social networks and social information and connections to get their utility back um, after a um, hurricane. Um, so we would think it's something that's solely isolated in physical systems, but to get that um, activated, you needed to have social connections as well. So I think there's uh, more um, emphasis on how the uh, networks are um, interconnected with each other. Professor perhaps from the learning aspect and the incorporation of learning. Yeah, so I guess one thing that is interesting or changing in our model world is how we get information, how we learn from this information. A lot more of our decision making is algorithmic. Someone's making the decision for us or someone's writing code for what the decisions are. This is coming from um, the information feed, that is what we read on the news, is basically algorithmically decided by some of the news providers like you know Google or Facebook's news, news feed um, from any design system where someone is learning to you know wrote a code or an algorithm to help us make decisions. Um, this raises a lot of sort of both interesting algorithms and very interesting societal questions. Uh, these algorithmic tools make decisions of what's useful information to have and collect information and have amazing potential to base this on or collect information way more than a human can collect and therefore possibly make much better decisions. Uh, at the same time, it also has the potential to inherit some of the human biases around and make biased decisions. And one scary aspect as watching what's happening out there in the world that most of us trust these systems more than we should. That is, it wasn't, I'm not biased, it wasn't my decision, it's the algorithm that told me to do this. But unfortunately, when these algorithms learn, learn what to do from our behavior, they inherit the very same biases that are out there in society. And unfortunately, now we trust them more than we used to, or we think they're more objective than we used to. We need to think about how to make these algorithms make better, better decisions. Probably we should learn how to trust them less, but also uh, improve this algorithmically speaking, and as someone who does algorithms for a living, we need to think about how to make these algorithms better, to make the, the, the VDAT, the human bias from the algorithm's decision making. We'll have enough uh, follow up as well to that. There's a lot of interesting things you brought up. So. Uh, I guess if I'm trying to be provocative, uh, I would say that we're moving towards social systems that uh, are going to be jointly populated by humans and AI agents. I mean, we actually 
following on what you're saying, there actually are AI agents that are interacting in our social systems right now. We just don't know that they are AI agents. Uh, you know, false identities that are meant to spread propaganda or change people's behavior. Uh, I think that's what's going on right now. Um, but what we will probably evolve to is actually ha having AI agents or chatbots that uh, can remember everything about us and can be our best friend because they can uh, interact with us in the ways that we want. Uh, and then we'll be dealing with uh, sort of a joint system at the social level where we have algorithms and uh, humans co-existing co uh, in this system. So that's my provocative statement. Very provocative, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to, from my perspective, uh, which uh, my research is in security currently and my interests, uh, the defining feature of technology today, the strange thing about it compared to the past history of the human species, and that especially holds for networks, is how much it has empowered small groups to impact negatively very, very large numbers of people. We've never had that before in the history of our species. And, and let me give you an example. There was a flash crash a few years ago where trillions of dollars of value were wiped out from the um, markets, world markets, and that was an oops. Someone who didn't intend to do it. You can imagine what someone who intends to do it could do. This, why was it an oops? Because the person doing it did it from the basement of his parents in London. Uh, it was a, you know, with a, a really old computer, actually. And uh, he didn't want to do it because he had already made $40 million quietly manipulating markets and trading on the manipulation. And he wanted to continue making his money. And what happened is, well, there was a positive feedback loop. Uh, you know, con con the impact of, you, you know what positive feedback is? It causes the instability. There is a change in one direction that self-reinforces and further self-reinforces. And the positive feedback loop causes instability. And, and, and it just self-reinforced. And there was a crash, a market crash, caused by one person. Um, so. Uh, I'd love if someone can tell me if there was any time in the history of humans where such small groups of people, like one kid, could wreak havoc on And you might think that the markets recovered within 10, 20 minutes. They did, but, but hundreds of billions of dollars were lost anyway. Why? Because when they, when they spiked down, people had sell orders, automatic sell orders. So they took the elevator down, the sell orders kicked in, the money was gone, they lost the money. And then when the markets quickly snapped back and recovered, you and I didn't lose because we, you know, we, we didn't do anything. We were teaching our classes. But someone who, uh, well, you know, real money was lost. Hundreds of billions of dollars were lost. And now the kid is being deported to the United States where he, you know, because he caused all these losses. And we, we have no sense of humor when it comes to money uh, lost. So uh, he faces, last I checked, 500 uh, years in jail or something like that for a very long list of. Uh, so this is a challenge for us. And uh, what positive feedback systems exist in networks that we are not aware of or, or that we are aware of, but nobody, none of the bad guys have yet identified? I, I've actually, I know some uh, that, uh, that could easily be swamped by a nation state. Not by a kid in the basement of his parents in London, but, but a nation state who wants to inflict huge damage on us, um, they could do that. And I, I could actually, I could tell them how. But, uh, but you know, it's really scary. It's really scary. I mean, it's, uh, uh, so I think this would be a, a big challenge. I, I see a lot of other bad things happening. I mean, I think there's good things. I think productivity will, will go up, unlike what we've seen now where productivity is sagging because there hasn't been enough time. The electric motor took 40 years to achieve its potential. And it didn't achieve its potential because of it was only it was miniaturized. It achieved its potential because people figured out how to use it in different ways on assembly lines. And um, so anyway, we, we're still, I think productivity will Im improve tremendously because of networks. Um, but I think other things like the truth will be a victim uh, because of human biases. Uh, it's very well documented that uh, uh, we humans in general, uh, there's, it's just called the reinforcement bias. Uh, reinforcement bias is when you hear something 
that, that agrees with your prior biases, you tend to believe it. And even when someone later on shows you that it is not true and patently false, it still is operative in your mind, and you're making inferences based on it. Um, and a truth that is inconvenient, that does not match your prior biases, is shelved. You have these mental compartments. And so, uh, so this, is, this is really not good news, and this was alluded to in others. So I will stop here, and maybe people can ask more. Yeah, yeah, so this brings up two questions, actually, on the reasoning side, one from the, the machine learning side, the tools that we use, and the other one is the people using the tools in, in the world. And so we can kind of take these two branches and things like security and so on will, will definitely come up. Um, and so let's go from, say, the machine learning side first. Um, using these different tools, deep learning and so on, uh, they need a lot of data. They can learn biases in the data like was brought up. Um, how do we know which data is right to learn from and who decides that? That way we don't get these biases. Any, any thoughts on that? Perhaps on the machine learning side? Yes. Uh, well, how do we know what data is right? That, uh, that's been a question for all of human learning as well uh, as machine learning. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of the issues that you see in the news right now with um, bias showing up in our algorithms comes from the fact that uh, the develop machine learning developers uh, really have not thought much about the input data. You know, we just frame it as an optimization problem. Somebody gives us some data. We learn a model to predict something. And we have just blindly trusted or not even thought about uh, whether that data is the right data to, um, you know, to get at an uh, accurate prediction model for whatever the application is. And uh, there's a lot more focus now on how to collect the right data uh, and have uh, in situations where often it's not entirely clear what you're trying to measure and the data that you have available is often only an indirect measure of what you really want to get at. So for example, if you're trying to get at people's utility functions or preferences, we never have data on that. We have indirect data on the actions that they take in the world. Uh, and often, I would say from the machine learning perspective, we've often just said, oh, OK, that's good enough. We'll just you know, take that at face value. Uh, and we really need to uh, rethink um, what is the impact of the data on, on the models that we have. And having a computational framework that um, would allow us to uh, measure the amount of error that we have due to the bias in the data is something uh, that I think we should move towards. A lot of the theoretical analysis of the methods focus on decomposing um, error under the assumption that you have data from the true distribution that you're trying to model, right? So even our uh, sort of analytic frameworks don't even acknowledge that we might have the wrong data. But I, don't, I, I, think, I think what is the right data is uh, maybe a better question for the social scientists than the computer scientists. Yeah, that was year. the next opinion I was going to go <laughs> yeah, for, so. is uh, social scientists. So I guess one way I don't know I can question your question is <laughs> in some of these social decision aspects, there isn't right data out there. The data about decision making is came from humans, and we know humans are biased. And so there isn't objective data out there. You're trying to, like, for example, in hiring someone or, or admitting students to your institution, you're trying to make a decision about someone's future potential. Uh, there is no data about the guy's future potential. There might be data about future potential of people like this correlated with their actual success when you admitted them, and maybe you can learn from that data. But I guess one thing that I think would help is to explicitly admit and try to study what biases the human decision making had and try to build that into your decision making system. The goal of the machine learning, the way it's sort of a simple optimization question or prediction is classically or simplistically, maybe classically, simplistically phrased as, as the machine should make the decision human would make. So you make the machine make decisions, and then on a few instances, you try it out on humans. And if humans make the same decision, 
then your machine was good. Well, if we think humans are making biased decisions, then this isn't the goal. We need to change the goal to make a decision that corrects for these human biases. For that, we first have to use the data to learn about human biases. And once we did that, then hopefully there is a chance to try to build machine learning tools that instead of copying our biases, correct for our biases. Um, so I don't know if this, the right data is, I think it's how we use the data and how we define the objective function, mm -hmm. which I think where might be the answer more. Well, I can let the social scientist answer <laughs> also. I just. You brought, brought in the idea of data to information. I think what's more um, interesting um, now is, and we've talked about this a little bit before coming to this um, panel, that people would think that um, they have more choices now in terms of um, accessing um, information and screening information because they've caused, and before we would have thought that it's more one way mass media, so when you turn on your TV, you have selection of channels, but that's about um, it in terms of how much information and how diverse information that you would be able to get. And now with all of these uh, more user um, oriented media and social media, we think we have a much broader array of information that's available to us, but with these um, algorithms that are embedded in like those Facebook LB and all these different news feeds, uh, it might not be that we are really selecting the information that we want to access and could be more determined by something else um, that's out there. So it's the idea of human agency and our belief in our agency in terms of being able to use and utilize information and data. Um, it's At the same, same time, I think that uh, the thing that is happening in that space is that all the people developing the algorithms and the systems are optimizing t for user engagement. And so if we are getting to a system that uh, limits information in a particular way to us, uh, at some level a response from the algorithm designers could be, well, it's getting to be that way because the humans prefer that, right? So if you're, if you're on one side of the political spectrum and you, the algorithm gives you articles from the other side, then the humans don't like that and they go to a site that gives them all the kinds of articles that they want to see, right? So we are sort of interacting with the algorithms in a way um, where I think we see ourselves as less biased than we actually are. And maybe that's one of the things that you wanted to talk about is that as a society, we're moving to this polarized uh, setting because we actually prefer that. Or I don't know, maybe, to, maybe we should think about it as a game, right? We're going to end up in a, in a situation where nobody is in the situation that they prefer, but because of our actions in relation to each other, we create this polarized system. Yeah. So. Let's say we have these, these tools up and running and they, they make decisions for us, say, for example, in the energy grid situation, um, or generally just we, we use them and there are potential security issues. If something goes wrong, who's responsible? What do you think about that? Is it the algorithm creator? I, I, can, I can answer that sure. one. There is no, no one is responsible. <laughs> so is this a way to offload? No one is responsible and everyone is responsible at the same time. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, suppose I write an algorithm for pricing or for trading. I cannot predict how it will, will it create a positive feedback loop that will wreak havoc in the real world? I would be foolish to tell you either way. Why? Because it depends on the algorithm she is writing. And in a very trivial example of this, uh, a trivial cycle of length two was created, a positive feedback on Amazon, and where a book, we were just talking about that, where a textbook was priced at $23 million on Amazon. You could actually get on Amazon, check for that book, and see that the, the price for it is $23 million. And that happened because my price read her price and reacted to it. Her price read my price and reacted to it. And it took all of three days for the price to go from something reasonable, like 100 bucks, to $23 million. This is a trivial example and easy to catch. No one is going to buy the book for $23 million. But if you're trading and doing things, so when the algorithms are in charge, uh, have you seen the movie Fantasia? The apprentice sorcerer in Fantasia who is playing with the... This is the situation we are in. Where there's a whole bunch of apprentice sorcerers who are, who are doing things that they cannot control, nor can they predict their consequences. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, that's my, my, my take on it. Yeah, yeah, so maybe perhaps the same the energy situation, if we had some AI agents or something controlling things and all of a sudden, say the Northeast got shut down for energy because of some unforeseen circumstance, who would the public want to maybe hold responsible then? Right, and again, the answer unfortunately is no one is responsible. And um, so this is, uh, I was just talking with the um, panelists before, so my view is indeed um, to have algorithms for controlling the uh, distributed resources because it doesn't make sense for individual humans to pay attention 24 seven on what the power prices are and what the current power system, the situation is, nobody cares. Um, so it makes a lot of sense for AI agents or whatever algorithms um, with, with all under the umbrella name of smart things and doing the supposed to be smart, right? And, but then when I do this research, I, I keep thinking of what if they're just a hacker that you know hack the system so that you know it could send out wrong signals in the sense that okay, for example, uh, during the you know two p two a two a.m. In, in the night and some hacker has in the system, everybody like it, it seems like everybody's using electricity, but actually it's not. So there are physical ways to check what the actual demand is, but then. If everything is like, so this is basically the cyber physical system aspect in my, in my mind. Um, so cyber side, it's very easy to hack, to manipulate. And then we need to have physical aspect to, to check if that, you know, the cyber side is correct or not. So I, I know Mike likes to use the uh, TVs or shows. I'm also actually watching the Mr. Robot, the show. So I don't know if you watch that, you know, basically, you cannot hack analog things. You can hack digital things, but not analog. Power system energy happened to be like, the physical side is analog, so, and then it's now, nowadays more and more connected to the cyber world. So my view is to, to really have a robust system, we really have to have you know, the, the, the physical world to be able to check if the cyber world giving the information is correct or not. And if that can be done, that should be responsible of the great operators or basically whatever central authorities, um, then that would probably minimize the, uh, the cyber side of the threat. So that's just my view. I mean, how to exactly do that, I, I don't know. Yeah, so do you think maybe we can create AI agents that can kind of run amok, and do you think we can actually control the things that we're building, maybe through incentives, um, setting up the right games for these uh, AI agents to live in? Uh, but do you think we can actually control, um, uh, build these systems without losing control? I mean, in principle, AI agents have a lot of great potential, right? That the whole point of using AI instead of human decision making is that AI has access to more information, it can process more information, it can think through consequences better. This is why AI chess algorithms work better than human chess players, no matter how well trained the humans are, and it's true for every other game. AI he has an incredible computation, can take advantage of incredible computational power and incredible access to information. Um, there are two issues that are really intertwined here. The, the AI having bad or unfortunate co consequences even without anyone's bad intention. Like I think in the example Mike brought up with the book getting priced at some insane amount of money, uh, there, no one wanted to have the book never bought again or whatever that priced us to a real book. Uh, there was no bad intention here. It's a, it's, I, I believe it's a very standard side of feedback loop when something is really low supply and then have a lot of copies on hand then maybe I could sell it a little bit more expensive than say, you know, Michael sells it. And unfortunately, Michael also doesn't have much supply and he thinks that because he doesn't have much supply, he can sell it just a little bit more expensive than I do because he's not in a hurry to sell his books. And if we feed back on each other, then that's what happens. The book price goes through the roof. We all want to be just a few dollars above what the other guy does. Um, there were no bad intentions. This is incentives going wrong or incentives were set up algorithmically to do something that seemed locally reasonable, but globally it wasn't, or at least the effect wasn't reasonable. And then there is the other issue that 
you brought, you brought up now, or actually many other panelists, is the, if someone's incentive is to wreak havoc, and can we control them? Um, and maybe on the, you know, can we defend against these things? I should defer to someone like Michael, who does security. Um, it definitely is a big issue of how much we can control these things, and part of it is that the decision making is happening so fast, and you know, big effects are happening in a, in a speed in which uh, human intervention is not usually viable, or not often not viable. But I guess Michael is more a security expert, well, so I... he'll more he know more than I do. Well, I think uh, there's two things that are really really bad. One of them is that. Economically speaking and effort-wise speaking, and the, 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 the attacker has an easier task than the defender. If I'm attacking your, your system, I need one weakness, and I'm in. Um, it's the weakest link situation. But if you're defending, it's a sum of efforts. It's the summation. It's the plus. You have to eliminate all vulnerabilities, pretty much because I will try every single one of them. So already the odds are stacked against the defense and in favor of the offense. That's one factor. What makes it lethal is the incentives are completely misaligned. I, there is absolutely no incentive uh, to, the, the, the incentives are perverse, really perverse. The, the or, in orga, organizationally speaking, the people who make decisions about security are not those who pay or suffer if uh, things go wrong. So they have every reason to not actually do security uh, effectively because they don't, you know, it, it hurts their bonus if they spend on security. And if something bad happens, then it's that other person who gets the blame for it. So the incentives are misaligned. Uh, and and th think about it, you know, who, so in the recent denial of service attack, the internet of things devices participated. So to speak, your toaster in your home participated in crashing some servers. And uh, look at the players. There is the buyer of the toaster and the person making the toaster that's connected to the internet. What incentives do they have to spend more money? Suppose now it's $5. Why should they make it $7? I make toasters, right? My customer doesn't want to pay more than $5. Now, the customer, what reason do they have to, who is suffering from the, the vulnerability? It's not the maker of the toaster, it's not the buyer of the toaster, it's some server in Europe that got crashed by a billion or, you know, toasters. They don't even know who crashed them, though, because there's no accountability on the internet, you know that. There's no reliable trace back. They don't even know what hit them. They don't, they, all they know is they got flooded with packets and, and their, their server crashed. They don't know it's your toaster. You see the situation. They, who, why should someone spend money on security? It's really a tough sell, security. I mean, think about it. You know, if, if, and also, what do you have to show for it? What you have to show for it is what did not happen, right? OK, so I, I go to my boss at the end of the, the year. I say, thank you for the half a million dollar. You see, nothing bad happened. You know what they would say? Across the hall, they didn't spend money. Nothing bad happened either. You're fired. It's a way of getting fired. I mean, really. You know, so it's, it's really, really tough. And uh, it, look, 20% of users use pet's name as password, their pet's name as password. 100% of users reuse passwords. The one that for this bank is the same as the one for that bank. You, you might wonder, well, I'm not stupid. It's not my password. Well, it affects you too. It affects you too because someone, it's a dormant account that's usually, it's someone else's account that usually compromises you. Like for us in computer science, you know, if we have an ancient account with a weak password, we're all at risk. It's not just that account that's at risk because the, the anatomy of a break-in is they found an account, they find an account, they break into it because of weak password or something. Then they do something called escalation of privilege. Escalation of privilege is basically you exploit a software vulnerability to become root to become administrator. And then you can't say, oh, your password is weak, but you know, it's you, it's not me. But we've had people who we, we ran actually a password attack on our own faculty once many years ago. <laughs> and we reported to them 
to those faculty their weak passwords. And we, you know, I, I remember hearing things like, look, I have nothing of important on my files. I can actually put them on the internet. I don't care if anyone sees them. And you have to explain to them, it's not about you. It's, it's, it's our system. It's the integrity of our system. You're, you're endangering us. And we tried to force people to use secure passwords uh, using random number generators. And that was very brief uh, and sad episode because actually that's when you walked into a colleague's office and you saw a little stick on <laughs> with, the, you know, with the password written on it because how else are you going to remember? But so the janitor could see it and actually I could see it. Uh, my vision was much better than now. You know, without squinting you could see. It. Anyway, I, I'm not optimistic, I'm afraid, and something needs to happen. I think at the legal end, the legal system has something to do with it. If you look at other technologies, it took decades, half a century practically, for people to realize that, to have accountability. You know, when, when, when people in the 1930s and 20s, early, early, when people were crossing the street and they got hit by a car, they didn't realize they could sue the driver, they didn't realize that they actually would limp for, they would pick themselves up and start walking and limp for the rest of their lives. It, it's the lawyers that figured it out. And now, you know, we have a system where cars are much more secure, people have, but it took a long time. Yeah. A new technology takes a long, and we are in the infancy. We think of it as advanced, but we are actually in the infancy of the information age and networking and all of this. So I think Accountability is very important, legal accountability, and, and we don't have that, you know, quite simply. That is, the entity that can do the most about mitigating the risk should be the one that bears the liability and bears the consequences of what they are doing. And the legal system has to change to make that happen, to have accountability. Otherwise, you're never going to have the problem solved. And I am confident it will happen, actually, eventually. Because why? Because it has happened with other technologies. And, you know, we've yeah, hopefully it happens before we hit the digital apocalypse or something like that. So We're not, you know, well. <laughs> um. yeah. So that's one aspect, I guess, the AI side. We can keep going on AI and accountability and security and so on for a while. We do have a time limit, though, but I do want to get the, the human side of everything. Um, and so how is the interconnected world, perhaps say from the social aspect to start off with, how has that changed maybe how we think about things, even from a purely logical perspective. Um, we had these old re reductionism and determinism that, that got us so far. Um, the interconnected world, has that changed whether we can use those rules or the extent to which we can use those, those old scientific rules? Um, going back to the issue of control and um, security um, and things, I think the extent to which we can understand um, how these patterns of inter interconnections um, work, um, or even um, intervene in um, design um, systems or connections or networks um, that work in um, different ways, because the outcomes of systems and like, the extent to which the system collapses or um, fails um, um, after a small amount of change, or like, um, like when you mentioned weak link, weak links, um, the extent to which system outcomes um, make differences will depend on um, how the system is engineered and designed. So for example, a system with uh, very central hubs um, will um, act very differently than a system that's more decentralized and more egalitarian. So the extent to which we can understand, um, and, and that's the field of network science, um, that the way, um, as, as, as much as we can um, um, understand and intervene with design networks, um, um, so we have much better idea of control of the systems, and that's how we can. Um, so if networks, we say complex networks, kind of where we have this organic structure that builds up, um, can we use something like the old tools, like a, can we reduce a large complex system to the parts, can we actually get something out of it, does that logic make sense when the system is quite different from how we thought about things say, 50 years and previous. Any thoughts on that, maybe even from the education perspective, how do you teach people to exist in a world where there's this interconnected structure, how is that different from taking a physics class 100 years ago? Any thoughts on, on that? It's a little bit trickier of a question. I mean, there's a lot of um, 
feedback effects, which is something we have been talking about, and I guess Michael was talking about the two-person feedback effect, but uh, which is already there. But there are other opportunities for very unfortunate feedback effects on large networks where the size of the effect scales with the size of the network. Like if there is a n people involved, then it multiplies by this n, which in a large network is very damaging. I guess one example of this is exactly around the security or, or you know, vulnerability game where, uh, you know, as Michael points out, the weak links matter, and often the weak links matter in a social network. And if, you know, if I go back to something classical, uh, this very same thing happens in, in um, 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 spreading of infections. Uh, we somehow got society uh, to agree that we need to inoculate our kids against all kinds of infections. Uh, in a selfish way of thinking about it, you should actually not. I don't mean to say this, I should, and I did, did uh, 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 have my kids, kids uh, inoculated also, but uh, selfishly speaking, if everyone else already uses vaccines, then every vaccine comes with a teeny bit of danger for whoever gets the vaccine. And in the socially, selfishly somehow best move for me is that you guys all get the vaccine, so therefore the disease is not spreading in society, and then I don't have to expose myself to the little bit of danger that the vaccine poses. Um, this exact same thing happens in all kinds of security aspects. And the best for me, if you guys all deal with, buy, and install the update in Microsoft and whatever is needed to secure your computers. And then I, when I connect on the network to your computers, then I'm not exp I don't have to bother with these things and I'm not exposed to these dangers. And for some reason, society went to the uh, system in which vaccination is essentially automatic and except for a tiny minority, uh, most of us believe that of course you're vaccinating your kid. Uh, and somehow we're in a state where we do not vaccinate our machines. Most of us do not, most people do not, or don't buy the proper um, guarantees for, for um, companies or for machines. Um, I, there is no way to change the incentive system. The incentive stays the same. It's in your best interest for everyone else to vaccinate and you do not. That is the best for you. But yet, our society went to a system where everyone vaccinates, or all the kids get vaccinated, uh, almost all the kids. And I hope, I'm not, I don't know if I want to be, predict the future, but I'm hoping that we're going to a system where somehow this became, will become automatic also, and we will do it, despite incentives to the otherwise. But uh, we can't change the systems. We, we, can't, we can't maybe change the system. We cannot change the incentives. And we have to get somehow either through a legal system or through cultural. There is no legal penalty for not vaccinating your kid or very low legal penalty for not vaccinating your kid. There is a societal expectation that you're going to do it and most people do do it. Almost all people do do it. And I hope that security will at some point become like this. But that's just a hope. I think it's a very good hope. I, I also have the same hope. However, one of the earliest results in, in, in security is, and actually it holds not just for security, but for most interesting properties, such as being ethical. Um, um, it's non-composability. Security is not composable. What it means is that you are secure, you have a system that is secure, with pieces that are individually secure, and you put them together and hell breaks loose. Uh, security is not composable, and other interesting properties are not composable. So it's a price of anarchy a little bit. Why? Because if you had a benevolent designer who imposes constraints on the pieces, they could actually design a, a secure system. The IBM 360, I'm dating myself here, the very ancient prehistoric <laughs> machine, was built and tested as one unit. And for economic reasons, we don't do it anymore like this. If you look at the browser, it's, it's little pieces that are written by different people that are perfectly fine individually. You know, and they're very secure individually. They are very quality pieces. But 
someone puts them together in a certain way, and then you have a very, very insecure, insecure browser. Um, and it's interesting to look at that from, you know, from that perspective of the benevolent dictator who, who has a centralized system versus the highly creative uh, but very insecure situation we, we are in. And it, creativity in the current situation is actually the flip side of, of the security. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. You have this uh, primordial soup of pieces pumping into each other, and we, we design new artifacts and new things that enrich our lives because of that. But the side effect is they're not secure. <laughs> in this, it's inherent in some sense. Uh, so, so if I try to go back to your question of uh, interconnectedness, I think that we always had interdependent systems, social systems, physical systems, natural systems. Uh, we just, from a scientific perspective, decomposed them and weren't because that was easier to do at the beginning. Uh, and I think uh, what's changed is that the scale of the systems that we have now and the speed at which information or data or whatever you want to call it in these systems or disease, the speed at which it can spread has really made it critical to start studying those dependencies. But they were always there. Um, and we just have to think of, you know, we just have to pay attention. I think a lot of fields are now starting to actually just study the dependencies uh, in order to understand what's going on. So I don't, I don't think it's anything necessarily fundamentally new that's happening now, but maybe that it's becoming more important that people study it that way. Yeah, yeah, it was more of, um, not that it's a new phenomenon, more of um, the, the fact that uh, these kinds of systems are growing, like you said, very rapidly and, and becoming more important. Uh, can we educate people to think better in that kind of a world? Or before they still existed, but they weren't so important that you could decompose something even if you really shouldn't. Um, now there are cases where you really shouldn't decompose it. How do you think about it? How do you make conclusions out of it? How do you understand it? Um, is there some kind of a change in, in, in education that we need to have? Yeah, I guess I was thinking about it more from the control perspective, that the typical ways that people would think about how to control, like in terms of regulations, like for vaccinations, there were decisions that could be made much more locally before. So like the U.S. could make a decision on a regulation, and that would change the basic behavior in the U.S., and there wouldn't be so much influence from you know, other countries, but now the ties are so strong in terms of travel or migration or connections on the internet that uh, the ability to have centralized control is pretty much gone. And so uh, now the control decisions have to be made in these more complex systems, taking into account what would happen with what the decision the other person is, is going to make. Um, yeah, I'd love to follow up on that, but I want to make sure that the audience has a chance for questions. Um, so if anybody wrote down questions, and some people might have a lot of questions, but um, just raise your hand. Um, it's a small enough room that way we can just uh, directly ask the panel. So anybody? I saw you guys both writing. Yeah, yeah. If you have questions, <laughs> just put up your hand and you can. You answer actually answer yes. most of my questions, but I have one. Uh, kind of you touched that, but you haven't answered completely. So um, it's in, in we, you talk about human biases. And you discuss that uh, we can have a computer, a, a, a AI biases built in to gain uh, profit for creator. Um, but it's in AI, but uh, we still have a human and humans, and we can create AI uh, with biases who will impact humans. Um, it's not, it will not be interaction between two AI and all this collapse will happen. Um, and it will not be like a virus, you cannot, if it's, it's, it can be just uh, some social, it can be fake news, something like that. But it will be create some algorithms that will create, that will be uh, hoping for this force feedback. It's more a uh, question about learning and um, how we can actually defend from this type. So it's how we can defend us humans with interaction with AI who predominantly, so, uh, who has this built-in uh, goal to uh, focus on our weakness, not on some computer or we 
kind of weakness, but on human weakness. Can so, be. Kind of how do we protect ourselves from yes, AI? Yes, humans. How we protect humans <laughs> from that. So, yeah, who wants to take that one? <laughs> kind of gets to the intent of question. Um, whether we can do I would defer to Mike's previous comment that it's, it's very difficult to protect from these kind of attacks. I think that uh, when I said that they're already in all the systems, you can see that in games that are trying to make people addicted to them, um, in social and information systems where you end up getting more and more information um, in a biased way that's focused on your preferences. Uh, I think it's hard to think about how to protect yourself from that without understanding how our own you know, sort of human behavior and how we, what are our preferences for those biases, right? So, the psychology of it, yeah. So, so I think what's going on is that, uh, you know, the developers of the technology and the algorithms and the systems have to be combining with the psychologists to, you know, take the ideas that they have about how we form habits and, uh, you know, look for information that supports our previous views, how that differs based on the type of topic that you're, uh, that you're focusing on, how to exploit people's fears. Um, all of these things um, are coming from knowledge and psychology. And I'm not sure that the algorithm developers are the ones to figure out how to protect us from that. Uh, really, we need um, the psychologists to figure out what are the right mechanisms or incentives to try to move people out of those um, scenarios. And I guess based on your talk yesterday, I think maybe it's not even possible <laughs> in these, uh, that we're in a, co in a complex scenario where uh, it's going to be hard to motivate people to move from their own selfish uh, perspective to actually um, you know, it's a, it's an. Uh, I guess the the technical term in AI would be that there's an explore exploit trade off, <laughs> and so the algorithms are exploiting, 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 and we're letting them because we want them to do that. Uh, we get a benefit from them um, being biased towards our preferences, uh, and then we get to some place down the road and say, hey, wait, I didn't want to be here, but along the way, every time they tried to exploit and show us something different, we just didn't take that option. So I'm not sure how to, uh, you know, control, I would say we'd have to learn how to control our own behavior to not selfishly uh, optimize for our own preferences. Maybe from the social side, if you see data that uh, says how bad we are at controlling ourselves. I think um, uh, I agree with the idea of uh, having to understand human motivations and um, how they make decisions and how they form biases. Uh, like there's um, some recent studies looked at how fake news and um, incorrect um, information spread more quickly than correct information. Um, and correct news, like on Twitter, on those channels. And so um, when we understand who we form ties with, um, who we would like to get information from, depending on the different topics and depending on different contexts, um, understanding how people um, access information um, ties with would be necessary um, for um, understanding the types of biases um, that are inherent um, in this world. Yep, question. Isn't, isn't this just a transitory problem? Because if you think about it, right, the fundamental assumption was we trusted news that came through the media, or we trusted algorithms to act in a way that was good. If you think about it, we do this all the time. You go to a used car salesman, you don't believe what they're saying because you're tuned to taking that information as something that is not going to be trustworthy for you. I trust my doctor probably a different way than the used car salesman. I, I have learned that behavior. When I was born, I probably didn't know the difference between a, a doctor and a used car salesman, but I've learned that. The same way, this information that's coming in, the assumption was because this was new model, or a new uh, mechanism, we assume that the algorithms, AI, all of this stuff was going to be trustworthy and that's what we were incorporating in our decision process. Now the fact is that everybody talks about fake news and everything is not trustworthy. We will incorporate that in our filtering of that information. So this is, isn't this just a blip that will get fooled by the next 
actor that comes in. It may be some next version of AI, and there will always be something new. But this is going to be something that humans tune to. I mean, it's already happened. Um, maybe, but AI decision making is 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 affecting all of your lives, and we all, not necessarily the five of us on the panel, but as a community, we are involved in writing these AI tools. And I guess we should do our best, or should do better than we're doing now, in having these AI tools help rather than hurt. AI decision maker is helping companies read CVs and figure out who to hire. Yes, at the end they go on an interview, but not all thousand applicants, only some of them. And the first phrase of processing is now an AI system. Uh, the bank will give loans to some people and some, they won't give loans to others. And at the end, some decision is made by a human, but some amount of filtering or rule or a recommended rule is written into the system as an AI, is a, is a machine learning system. Um, sentencing in criminal cases or setting bail is also, there is much more algorithmic aspect nowadays. These algorithmic aspects have a potential they can take more information, they can use more information, and they can be better than the randomness of a human decision maker, but they can be worse also. Uh, and at the moment, we do have both a, an algorithmic problem, that is, this, some of these decision makers are actually pretty bad, uh, and we do have a legal problem that I guess Mike was more talking about, is if a a uh, human decision maker made a decision against you, like didn't set the bail so high you couldn't get out of jail, maybe there is a, a you know, appeal process. But if it's the algorithm that made the same decision, unfortunately the appeal process uses a very same algorithm. There is only one algorithm for setting bail. And they use the same algorithm. They say, well, it's not my fault the algorithm set it wrong, but there isn't an appeal process. And it's machine learning what's inside. So there isn't even a proper explanation of why the hell you can get out of jail or why you didn't get your loan or why you didn't get hired. Machine learning is great. It can do amazing things. But one thing it's not doing so well is explaining why it made that decision. So you're not entitled to an explanation. There's no appeal process available. And you're just host. And it could have been the wrong decision, clearly. I, not all decisions are perfect. So there is something where we need, where algorithms can help, algorithms currently helping, and we should do better in making these algorithms, you know, use the information right. And more importantly, uh, people will trust what the algorithms are doing when the outcomes are consistent with their own biases. So, uh, so it's not as obvious as the, you know, shady car salesman, right? If, if you yourself have a personal bias that would show up in the loan system, then when the algorithm, you know, makes decisions that reflect what you think is appropriate, you stop, you just trust it and you stop debugging and you just move on. One thing I just want to throw out, I don't know the answer, but a recent question, would cross-sourcing uh, cross be a solution? For example, uh, Facebook is using, putting Wikipedia on the side of news to check if that's a fake news or not. So basically, can we trust collectively the crowd appeal as a way to correct the algorithm's bias or something? I don't know, I'm just throwing that out. So that's a large population game. Really. Yeah, so I, I guess sometimes I give uh, students this example with uh, respect to self-driving cars and what sort of um, decisions they would make if you're thrown into a situation where you're driving down the road and you're going to have to crash and you can either, uh, you know, keep going and uh, into a big, you know, multi-car crash, kill 50 people, or you could veer off to the side of the road and kill your grandmother, right? And so which do you, which do you pick? Um, I think one of the issues is that our algorithms uh, we expect are going to make one decision and the same decision every time, right? We come up with a deterministic algorithm and then people argue about the utilities of those things. But when you think about the crowdsourcing view of it, as humans, we're not all going to make the same decision in that scenario. And so having 
I hesitate to say that we would have some sort of randomness <laughs> in the algorithms, but in cases where we don't all agree on the utility for a particular outcome, uh, I think it's just an interesting philosophical issue to think about as what should the algorithms do because in a crowdsourcing scenario, there will be one predominant um, uh, view, but not everybody's going to have exactly the same view. So I don't know if that actually answers your question or not, but yeah. that's what I think about when that, I that think question. About. I think it has a separate panel associated yes, with it. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> we'll go to the uh, next question. So I guess you know, I mean, um, building on some of the comments just made. So you know, when you when you think about uh, choices and preferences that I think Jen was talking about, and then the biases, now. Um, we, we, as humans, we come up with acumen. I think that's the idea about salesmen and the doctors. But then, these are cases where we are probably not encountering them on a daily basis or a minute basis. It's basically like we have sufficient time to do some learning to come up with your acumen about these decision scenarios. But then, when you're thinking about these algorithms that are just surrounding us all the time, and it's influencing our thinking, we strategically also changing ourselves. So it's a dynamic environment going back to your talk last uh, yesterday. So now, how do you now develop? So if and you are competing with other AI algorithm writers, right? It's, it's a competitive situation. Everybody's writing their own AI tools. But if you're trying to do good things, but then people are changing on a daily basis based on the information they're gathering, how do you cope with that? Create AI or create AI? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then we've hit the, the, the digital apocalypse for sure. So uh, I don't know if you wanted to take up that question. Or... I'm not. I'm not sure. Like, true, the world is changing. Um, you know, good AI systems can adapt to changing worlds. I guess I'm much more worried about the incentive misalignment that. You know, as it was pointed out a lot of times, if you write your system to be a little bit more in line with what people prefer, then people use that one all the time. So if you write something that's socially good, uh, you might just lose out the competition to someone who didn't care about that aspect. Yeah, even accepting it is. It's, you know, individually, we might all say we are for socially good, but our actions speak louder than our words. And our actions suggest that we are selfishly optimizing for ourselves, even when we say we don't do that. Um, so that's what I'm really concerned about. And I guess the most positive view I can offer is the vaccination story. We somehow are vaccinating our kids. It's really cool that we are. And I hope it will stay that way. And I hope the electronic word will somehow more become like the vaccination story. That, but it might not. It might not. Interesting. So I guess we're basically out of time. So um, a lot of these questions went off to <coughs> learning and so on in terms of how to reason in this uh, complicated world. And so I guess the answer is we prefer not to and let somebody else do it. Um, and so um, I guess we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for, for attending. I think it was an excellent panel. If we could thank the, uh, the panelists. Um, and then that will be it. You can have a great day. So thank you very thank much. You.